Before we get started with the show, I just wanted to say thanks to Derek for uh, his advice and uh, really how I'm just trying to become a student of finance and better understand money and how it can help us uh, and sometimes hurt us. Uh, as residents, you guys have really um, done something incredible, which is you have put off that uh, full-time pharmacist pay uh, for what is hopefully a better job after residency. So again, I, I commend you for that. But what you're going to find is that uh, that amount of money just does not go far enough. So I do recommend uh, finding your unicorn job, uh, narrated by uh, Mike Lenz, who is turned his voice narrating side hustle into a full-time gig where actually he's a full-time narrator and has left uh, the pharmacy profession. Uh, but check out Unicorn Jobs for Pharmacists. I'll put the link in the show notes. I think it'll be really useful for you. But here's the show. Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. I'm of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I have Derek Delaney on, uh, who is a great financial resource um, that we want to kind of lean into and talk a little bit about what you're going to be doing as you're uh, either entering residency or leaving residency. Uh, and we're going to go through kind of 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s and talking about what are the big, big things you should be doing uh, at each of those age groups. So Derek, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Okay. Well, I did just catch actually your your episode on uh, Amazon and spending. I think it was on RPH Ally. So yeah. uh, if anybody has not seen that, that's kind of a neat take on are we spending more or are we spending less because we can get everything at the click of a button? That was really kind of cool. But I think that lends into uh, the first kind of point, which is um, I think it comes down to habits and a lot of habits that you automate. Um, as somebody who is getting into residency or just leaving residency, they're usually in their 20s or 30s. There are some exceptions. But what are the big take-homes that somebody in that position should really be doing in terms of getting the right habits so that they can be successful later. Uh, it just is painful to look back personally uh, to now know the power that money can have and kind of that rule of multiplying by 88, your dollar could be worth $88 later type of thing. Um, but what about 20s and 30s? What are those good habits we really want to get into? Yeah. So I am a firm believer that habits are developed through self-recognition, looking at what your previous history is and the actions that you took in the past and understanding how they created the circumstances you're in today. And when it comes to your finances, I think the best thing anybody can do is to, in a simple way, monitor their financial situation month to month, year to year. So you have actual physical, or not physical, but actual analytical data you can look back on and, and really be able to see how the decisions you made in the past impact where you are today, which is going to reinforce the good habits. And it's going to allow you to see bad habits that maybe got you into positions you didn't want to be in um, to begin with. Well, let's talk about that briefly, because you've had a couple of points about that on former episodes. Do you want to tell people about your podcast real quick? Because I'm going to keep referencing it over and over again. Yeah, sure. So I have a podcast. I'm about 87, 88 episodes in right now. It's called the Farm D Money Podcast. It is a podcast that gets um, uh, that that goes out every other week, and it's designed to help pharmacists with their money. It's about ten to twelve minutes long, so it's supposed to be a podcast that's easily digestible. It's got a lot of action steps packed into the episodes that pharmacists can take and use instantly in their own financial life. Okay, we'll put a link to the podcast in the show notes. But there's one episode where you said you. You went kind of against the the common wisdom that you should have a budget, but you gave good rationale, which was, and correct me if I'm wrong, you said it's better to look back and kind of look at why you did those things uh, than ultimately fail at a budget, which uh, very much is like kind of like the uh, the weight loss thing, where we know we have to eat better, we know we have to lose weight, we know we're supposed to eat different, and it's just better to maybe look and see, okay, well, why did I eat that? Well, like today, I'm like, well, why did I have that bowl at Kentucky Fried Chicken? It was on the way. It was on the way. And I didn't pack my lunch. I had forgotten to pack my lunch today. If I had packed my lunch, I would have paid a dollar for lunch instead of six. 
and I would have had 300 calories instead of 700 calories. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about the thoughts about budget versus uh, that looking back and and uh, doing it that way. So to to be totally fair, I thought budgets were a great way to improve your financial standing a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And it just through personal experience, you try it, you try it, you try it, and nothing really comes of it. And I've come to realize that in my opinion, budgets are aspirational in nature in okay. trying to create a fixed financial environment into an unpredictable future just doesn't work. It's like creating New Year's resolutions on January 1st to lose a bunch of weight. And then all of a sudden you get to February and things happened in life that you didn't anticipate that were out of your control, forced you out of those New Year's resolutions and ultimately you fail. And when it comes to setting up a budget for most people, that's usually what happens. Where if instead you create um, some sort of mechanism where you can track your expenses and track your financial life, you can then take that information, look back, reflect on it, realize why things change and why things turned out the way they did and use that information to make smarter decisions moving forward. And ultimately, that's where good habits are developed. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're let's say we're, we're taking good care of our, our money that's coming out. Uh, to be honest, the, the best way to save money on college is to go to the right one in state, you know, spend less. You can spend anywhere from 80000 to 300000 on pharmacy school these days. Uh, you just happen to be in Minnesota. I happen to be in Iowa. We happen to be in two of the top best states to be one, a pharmacist and to to go to pharmacy school on the relatively uh, inexpensive. Um, but tell me a little bit about the service you offer in terms of someone who is going to eventually come to this question where they have X amount of dollars coming in as a pharmacist and they're going to be like, OK, well, I want to buy a house and I want to have a family and I want to save for retirement and I want to pay off my student loans, which will be coming due soon. Um, how do you guide someone through that process? And I've just learned uh, to no longer give blanket advice uh, that every single person seems to have their own completely different set of circumstances. It just it just doesn't work with the blanket advice, I think. I I agree with you 100%. Everybody's individual circumstances are different. So the advice and the route I would recommend somebody taking um, in that situation would be completely different depending on who I'm talking to. But regardless of what financial situation you're in, when you find yourself at that point in life and you want to start making good decisions, it's really, really important to project out what those different paths will lead to. Because then when you have a better idea of what your future might turn into based on the decisions you make today, you're ultimately going to be able to see the give and take of those decisions, short-term and long-term. And the biggest one for a lot of people, and you brought it up earlier, Tony, is they want to buy a lot of things now that they have this brand new spanking job and they're fine (laughs) for you and good income, but you have a lot of debt you have to worry about as well. Well, what is the opportunity cost of avoiding paying off that debt early and going and purchasing that home or extending those student loans out instead of 10 years out to 20 or 30 years? What's that going to look like 10, 15, 20 years from now? And what is the opposite of that going to look like? And being able to project those different scenarios is going to allow you to provide more clarity for yourself on what truly is important today and what's truly important in your future. Ultimately, then leading you to the decision that's going to um, create the best outcome with both of those scenarios in mind. Okay. All right. So um, one last point I want to cover is kind of net worth uh, where, uh, you know, the calculation, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but the calculation is your assets minus your liabilities or uh, what you have minus what you owe. And uh, if you look at median net worth versus average net worth, there is a huge gap. So the median net worth around 35, I think, is 90,000. But the average net worth at 35 is around 400,000. If I'm, I think I've got that number right, right around 4, 430, something like that. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of accumulating that net worth? Because it's the time, am I saying it right? The time value of money? Is, it, is that the, the the term? Okay, so can yes. you talk about the time value of money? Basically, when somebody has a, a million dollars making 10% and someone has $100,000 making 10%, something like that. Yes, you're exactly right. It all comes back, back to one single word, and that is the power of compounding. 
Oh yeah. Okay. Compounding is at, should be the number one thing young people who are trying to build their financial wellness should have their mind set on. And it's essentially just what you mentioned, Tony, where the faster you can accumulate, the quicker that money is going to compound and grow from an exponential standpoint as you get older. And right. I know there are a bunch of people out there who've mentioned this before, but you could, and I'm just making up the numbers here, but if you're a 23-year-old, you could set aside $200 a month for five years and then stop investing. And you'll be better off by the time you're 40 than if you started at 30 and invested $1,000 a month. It because just breaks of- my heart. As, as a 50-year-old, mm-hmm. I know the numbers for, for me and it's just... Uh- it's very, very hard <laughs> not, okay. to, not to look back on my 20s and wish I had been better. So. But it is so much easier said than done because when yeah. you're young, you want to go out and you want to buy that house because you need a place to live. You need a vehicle. People end up having families and kids get really, really expensive. You have student loan debt. You probably have other debts. And a lot of that stuff will take up your free cash flow, ultimately not allowing you to invest as much as you want until later in life when you can earn more and pay a lot of that debt off. So it's a yeah. tough circumstance to be in, and it's a tough <clears throat> uh, line to walk. I've heard it called the messy middle before, where your net worth goes up, and then children happen, and then there's a there's a dip, and then you kind of recover. So anything else about the 20s or 30s before we go on to the 40s? I know that that, that kind of uh, you know area is really just kind of surviving it, amassing as much as you can. Um, maybe to some extent getting rid of the student loans. Uh, if you're on that 10 year, you should be done by 35 ish uh, in general. Uh, anything else in that group? And then, in addition to what we said before, continue, even if it's just a little bit, invest money, save money, put money away for your future self. It's okay. going to be really, really tempting to take the fancy vacation to buy this and that and to keep up appearances in certain situations. But if you can avoid that and invest money, your future self is going to thank you for that immensely. Yeah, my future self is not happy with my old self. All right. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the 40s because I think this is where those kind of high earning years come. You start getting into those executive positions. If you've, uh, I, I know that if, if you're in staff or in management, you don't necessarily go up in, in many of the community and uh, hospital dispensing roles. But if you do kind of get into those higher roles, these tend to be some pretty big earning years in the 40s. Um, tell me a little bit about what, becomes different. In this decade, this is where, in my opinion, and based off of my experience working with people who are in their 40s or families who are in their 40s, this is where lifestyle creep happens the most. Okay. Where all of a sudden you earn a lot more and your lifestyle follows suit. So your savings rate doesn't change. And ultimately for a lot of people, their net worth doesn't seriously grow as much as it should either because they're stacking on a lot of debt, whether it's newer or fancier cars, second home, stuff like that. So be aware of lifestyle creep in this stage of your life. Okay. So the forties are lifestyle creep. I, I listened to, uh, uh, I will teach you to be rich. I I can't remember his name. I think it's Ramit or something like that. And he talked a lot about how that, that tends to happen where he, he, would you know make little changes as he kind of went along, but that it's just inevitable that you're going to start comparing yourself to the people near you. You start your mortgage all over again because now you've moved into a nicer house, bigger house, and we've been very fortunate not to not to do that. Though I assure you, my wife would be happier with a soaking tub, a mud room, <laughs> and a three seasons porch. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm I'm just. Uh, that, that, that would have been what we would have done under probably normal market conditions. Uh, mm-hmm. We probably would have done that. So that kind of takes us to the 50s uh, where I am. And I don't know if it was just kind of like, uh, you know, lightning bolt that hit me or maybe that I could mathematically on my fingers start adding how many years it was till my kids are going to go to college. <laughs> but all of a sudden, uh, my reticular activator just lit up and all of a sudden I'm seeing um, important money lessons everywhere besides the regret about my 20 year old self. And what are the things somebody who's 50 really need to know? Because I feel like you talked in one of your episodes, how you can arrive at 62, which right now would be the earliest time you can take social security. Uh, and there are many reasons not to, and there are some reasons too, but it, you said it was too late. You, you should have really talk to 50 year old self to kind of set up for that. Can you explain what you meant by 
um, you know, it's it's a little bit not not necessarily too late, but uh, you would do you would be much better off if you had started planning in your fifties. Oh yeah, you're exactly right. Well, I always tell people compare it to trying to train for a marathon. If you give yourself a year to start training, you can map it out, slowly build that progression, slowly build out those runs Uh and do it in a healthy and a sustainable way. Where if all of a sudden you decide you want to run a marathon two weeks from the actual (laughs) start of the event, it's going to be crazy, hectic. You're going to get hurt. It's not going to be an experience you're going to like, and you're going to regret a lot of the decisions you make in that short period of time. The same thing applies to retirement, where if you can start looking ahead and making small, smart decisions in your fifties, one, it's going to decrease the pressure on yourself for making those decisions because they're going to come in small intervals. And then two, it allows you to um, use the power of compounding on those small decisions to make huge impacts by the time you get into your sixties. And one of the biggest areas I see people be able to do that in is through proactive tax planning. Because taxes are one of two of the biggest expenses usually for people once they get into retirement up there with healthcare expenses. Yeah, we're, we actually pay more in taxes than a pharmacy resident makes in a year. So we, we are very, very aware of the, the, the power and pain of, of those taxes. Um, so in your last episode, you talked about how now is actually a really good environment in terms of the floor. And I think that while people sort of understand ETFs and, and maybe those uh, mutual funds and things like that, I think fixed income is something that is is certainly a little bit more uh, difficult, especially when we start getting into ladders and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about how now, w- first explain what the concept of the floor is, but the fact that I could probably go on right now and get a treasury at four and three quarters, I could probably get a CD at five if I'm three months to a year, something like that. Can you explain the floor and how that kind of stability actually is a good thing? But also for those that are younger, it's maybe a bad temptation to get into something that's guaranteed then when you're really going to need the power of maybe equities to kind of carry you through those higher percentages. Yeah. So the floor, and and correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, but we're talking about an income floor, right? Yeah. 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 So I I thought you, I thought you were meaning like a floor, like the, yeah, an income from the fixed securities and that now I can get four or 5% and then I can be a lot, I don't have to go so much into the equities because there's actually a a, a percentage that's being paid. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that all comes back to one of the biggest things you um, should have prepared for yourself in your 60s if you do want to retire in your 60s. -hmm. And it's your income distribution plan. How are you going to pay yourself in retirement? And before 2022 happened, before interest rates skyrocketed, a lot of these retirees, specifically early on in retirement, who had the next 30 years of their lives to have to afford, had to take on extra risk than they otherwise probably would have wanted to, to get the type of returns that they needed in order to sustain their lifestyle. Okay. But after 2022 and after these incredible interest rate increases, people can be more conservative with their money because now there is that percentage floor that bonds are offering from an interest rate standpoint that people can count on, which means they don't have to take as much risk on the equity side because a lot of the rate of return that they need to live off of can now be sourced from those bond investments due to those increased interest rates. And then you had mentioned, maybe this is going down a rabbit hole we shouldn't go into in this one, but Uh, Maybe I'll just leave it for them to contact you. But if you want to just touch on the fact that you also mentioned that annuities would be a little bit of a better situation uh, than they were before. Yeah. So annuities are contracts with insurance companies. I think everybody knows that where you hand over a sum of money and in return at some point in a simplified, simplified form, the insurance company is going to pay you an income stream for probably the remainder of your life. Right. Well, when interest rates were really, really small, insurance companies would earn a lot of their profit based off of net interest rate spread in margins. And when interest rates were almost zero, those margins and spreads were basically zero as well. So they weren't able to offer a lot of great payouts Mm -hmm. on their annuity products. And now that interest rates have gone up, you're starting to see these payouts offered on these annuity products increase, which is just more money you're able to get from the insurance company based off of the same amount of money you gave to them compared to just 18 months ago. 
Okay. And this is exactly how every single conversation goes. I, I'll, I'll mention to the audience, I was at APHA and I was in a, a, one of these uh, financial um, uh, money management uh, for pharmacists type of thing. And invariably, the conversation will go to something like this, where it goes beyond the scope of of what most people know, and then we, we uh, it would be good to come to you to, to kind of ask you for, for your expertise and why I wanted to introduce everybody to you. Uh, because uh, at the end of the session, sure enough, somebody asked a question and all of a sudden we're like, okay, here we go, backdoor Roth. And we're, we're in these just very, very uh, niche or niche uh, questions that, that simply uh, don't have a good general answer or the general answer may be wrong. Um, and- so go ahead. And I was going to say, as you get older and as your net worth continues to grow, those questions still are top of iceberg questions, where once you get below the surface of the water, the the, the iceberg analogy it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. There are questions that very smart people, pharmacists in general, don't even know to ask about their finances once they get to certain ages and certain net worths that good financial planners will be able to bring to light for them that could save them a tremendous amount of time and money over the long term. So as you get older, that becomes just more and more important, specifically as your net worth rises. Yeah, I'll, I'll give the the audience an example. So my wife is 11 years younger than me. And so that means that I can choose to take retirement at 62, 65, 67, or 70 with Social Security. And then because she's 11 years younger, that means that um, it may not make sense for me to take it until a lot later uh, because she's still going to be working and then she's going to get full government benefits because she works for the VA. Anyway, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but basically those are the types of of things that just become so individualized that I think an expert like you is uh, absolutely essential. Well, so then- that kind of segues into what's the best way for people to contact you? Yeah. So the best way to get a hold of me would be to visit my website if you want to talk one-on-one and schedule a free consultation. So I offer free consultations to anybody who books that meeting to have just a general 15 to 20 minute conversation about what they're looking to accomplish, why they're reaching out to a financial advisor and the type of services I provide to see if we're a good fit. Otherwise, if you have a specific question, I have a chat box on my website. You'll be able to type something in that goes directly to my email. And I try to respond within the same day I get those type of inquiries. Okay. And then aren't, are you still doing the Ask Me Anything uh, thing with uh, RPH Ally? Yeah. Yep. I still do that. Um, if you have specific topics of things you'd like me to talk about, um, I can do those in a number of different um, content outlets that I have, some through RPH Ally, through my podcast, or any other outlets that I utilize. So if there are specific things you want to know about finances, feel free to reach out to me and let me know. And I'm happy to explain that to you in a one-on-one basis or keep it private and use that information as a topic in one of the content outlets I use in my practice. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for being on the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Tony. Thanks again for listening to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. I hope you uh, enjoyed what Derek had to say. And again, I think that finding your unicorn job is going to give you uh, really an idea of other things that pharmacists have done uh, in their spare time. And the thing is, is that if it's something that you love that's outside of your residency or work, uh, it really doesn't feel like work. Uh, and it's uh, something that you can do when you're a little bit exhausted. Uh, if you got questions for me, Tony the Pharmacist at gmail.com. Exhausted. Uh, if you got questions for me, Tony the Pharmacist at gmail.com.